Hello, this is Richard, and I'm here to introduce the latest space adventure featuring Astro Pup and his comrade, the Parrot, who is a major in the Space Force. If you heard the most recent story, you'll know that the Parrot has stood trial for disobeying orders. The court-martial cleared him of all charges on the grounds that he was not a rational or responsible being. He was so insulted that he resigned his commission and retired to a bird sanctuary in England. But as you will hear in this story, Destiny called on the parrot to save the world. And now I will bow out and let Astro Pup take up our story. Almost everything I have described so far in this memoir, I have witnessed with my own eyes or smelt with my own nose. This chapter is different. Most of these events took place in a place called England, and as I might have mentioned, I'm currently stationed in the Middle East. I heard what I'm about to tell you from the Parrot Major, but you can trust every word of it, because he's a most particular and precise bird in my experience, and not at all prone to exaggeration. Now, somewhere up there, in the outer reaches of darkest space, there is a giant ship shaped like a bird. I've described it before. It has an enormous beak that snaffles up any spaceship that is unlucky enough to wander across its path. This story begins with that ship of birds swallowing a stray spacecraft. Inside the belly of the ship, the zillions of birds who flocked around the captured capsule were in luck. When they pecked it open, they found that it was full of rubbish. I mean, the sort of stuff that humans don't want to eat, like cold baked beans, mouldy sliced bread, bacon rind, and nuclear waste. I don't want to baffle you with science, but it's worth reminding you that this intergalactic aviary is powered by electrical impulses generated by bird brains. The Commander-in-Chief is a wise old owl who sits at the top of the ship's tree and whose mighty mind is plugged directly into the navigation and life support systems. When the rubbish capsule came to his attention, he wanted to know which planet was rich, fertile and free from hunger enough to jettison such rich pickings of food into outer space. He applied his intelligence to the problem and traced its origin back to Earth. He found that our beautiful blue planet has so much more to offer than garbage. It's full of delicious seeds and fresh water. The gardens are teeming with worms. There is no shortage of mice and other lovely vermin that the birds with long talons like to snack on. The trees provide wonderful branches for nesting. He saw that there was a native bird population, but that they were inferior in brain power, backward in technology, and could easily be enslaved. As for the humans, he assessed that they were a bit more advanced, but primitive nonetheless. The only negative that he could discover were the cats but they were as yet to develop any advanced weaponry beyond their teeth and claws. After years of wandering in space, the owl had found the perfect bird colony. That must have been when he took the decision to invade our world. First in were an advanced party of elite sparrowhawks. They began to take out the pigeons who are famous for hopping around Trafalgar Square in the centre of London. Eagles struck stray cats in the city of Milan in northern Italy. Owls came in under the cover of darkness and began to take over barns in the midwest of the United States. The humans noted some of these strange occurrences and reports appeared in the news, but nobody was much bothered. For who on earth speaks up for the rights of pigeons or stray cats? Animals and birds do not have a voice in the parliaments of the humans. We are treated like, well, well, animals. 
Anyway, I digress. These early victories were all too easy. They fueled the confidence of the invading flocks. More space shuttles landed with more and more birds. They began to muster their forces unseen in the woods. The greatest concentration of them was on the rainy island known as Great Britain. This is also where the parrot happened to be living at the time and he was able to describe the events there in detail. The skies of southern England were filled with the silhouettes of the invading bird fleet. They blocked out the sunlight as they passed overhead. The tweeting and twittering was deafening. They landed to feed and soon the crops in the fields were devastated and the famous rose gardens of England were laid to waste. Those greedy birds were a giant eating machine. It was a bad time to be a worm or a caterpillar. Anything small that showed his head was gobbled up. The invaders were following the course of the River Thames. The Prime Minister decided he must take action before they reached the capital city, London. He picked up his red phone and called the commander of the Royal Air Force, otherwise known as the Few because they have so few aircraft. The entire force, half a dozen jet fighters in all, scrambled to intercept the bothersome birds. But what could they do? Their missiles just flew straight through the flocks and in between the feathered bodies. There were some very impressive whiz-bang explosions in the sky, singed feather and some angry birds. But instead of flying away, the invaders wheeled around and flew towards the jets. The pilots found that their vision was blackened on all sides. Some of the birds quite suicidally flew into the engines. The finely tuned machines choked and splattered and the jets spiralled through the skies and crashed in flames in the fields. An hour later, the birds descended on the landmarks of London. Hyde Park, Buckingham Palace, Big Ben and Tower Bridge to name a few. Things were looking grim. There is a legend that when the black ravens who guard the Tower of London leave their posts, that will be the moment when the city will fall to invaders. Well, a rumour started to spread that they had flown away in terror from the strange incoming birds. They were all over the city. You couldn't walk down the street without getting a face full of feathers or your nose pecked or your head pooped on. The Queen cancelled her garden party. The MCC called off the cricket match at Lord's. The Kennel Club postponed crafts. All the cafes, pubs and restaurants closed because when you put food on the table, it was gone as soon as you could say, tweet, tweet. The people of London, who include more or less every nationality of the world, resisted the bird blitz with brollies, walking sticks and bits of scaffolding. The fire brigade turned their hoses on the winged attackers. Builders and window cleaners struggled with dive-bombing gulls at the tops of high buildings. Policemen took out their notebooks and filed lengthy reports. And though I'm no fan of cats, I must say that the feline population fought bravely too. Dogs, of course, lack the stealth and the sharp claws to deal effectively with feathered pests. But I'm told that the brigade of dogs valiantly woofed their vocal support and chased the birds out of the garden squares. Finally, after three dark days, the flock of birds moved on. They had pecked every last crisp crumb off the pavements of London. They headed for Epping Forest and then for the Midlands and the farmers' fields. Now, what I'm about to tell you is a state secret. But as we know that dumb animals are immune from persecution, I'm going to tell you anyway. The War Cabinet 
chaired by the Prime Minister, had decided that crop sprayers would fly over the invaders and cover them with poison. The countryside would be littered with the bodies of deceased birds and pretty much any other living thing that was unfortunate enough to be sprinkled with the deadly spray. It was a ghastly scenario, but there were no other viable weapons at the human's disposal. What the people did not understand and failed to calculate was that way out in space, a wise old owl was monitoring the human's communications and knew all about their panic and plots. The humans had no idea where the birds had hatched out so suddenly and in such numbers, and although many theories were floated, nobody seemed to have suggested that they could have come from another world altogether. That is why what happened next was so unexpected. The birds' commander-in-chief gathered his flock of top thinkers, some of the most high-powered parrots and parakeets in the universe, and told them to focus their brainwaves on the Earth's communication systems. The effect was instant and devastating. Mobile phones went dead, the fibre optic cables clogged up, the satellites switched off, there was no TV, no radio, no internet. Ordinary people suddenly found themselves back in the age of the typewriter. The only communications coming in and out of government were either on paper or in Morse code, tapped along copper telegraph wires. You might think all this would have negligible effect on the animal population. But you'd think wrong. The shops did not know how to order their pet food. Dogs went without their meaty chunks. Birds missed out on their seed. And that was when our friend the parrot, formerly a major in the Space Force, could hold his beak no longer. Hitherto, he had been monitoring events from his bird sanctuary in the southwest of England. He had followed it all on Twitter, and he admitted to me later that he had a feeling of satisfaction at the human's problems. He used some long-learned Germanic word for it, which I forget. Schaden, Fraden, Ruff, or something like that. He wasn't exactly gloating, but he thought to himself that only he knew who was behind these avian attacks, and if they hadn't hounded him out of the Space Force, how useful he would be to the humans now. At last he could watch on no more. He resolved that the time had come to intervene. And so the parrot discharged himself from the sanctuary and flew down to the British naval base in the port of Plymouth. Imagine a rear admiral of the Royal Navy sitting around with his officers, unable to communicate with his frigates and submarines and what have you out on the ocean wave. There was absolutely nothing for them to do. So in the time-honoured tradition of all salty seaworthy types, they were playing cards and drinking rum. In flies a parrot, like something that belongs on the shoulder of a pirate, and says, I must get a message to the Prime Minister. Well, I don't have to tell you that they weren't at all persuaded by this avian utterance. In those dark days, anyone wearing a coat of feathers fell under immediate suspicion. In fact, if you were a bird, you were lucky if they didn't shoot you on sight. And so it was entirely in the spirit of the times that the rear admiral drew his pistol from the drawer and pointed it straight between our bird's beady eyes. The parrot said, Go ahead and shoot. But if you do, you'll destroy the world's last chance of survival. Well, a line like that was enough to give even a drunken sailor pause for thought. If you don't mind, sir, said one of the more clear-headed junior officers, before you pull the trigger, I'd just like to ask that bird where he learned to speak English like that. Good idea, said the rear admiral. 
I was curious about that, too. Better interrogate the prisoner. The junior officer stood up, steadied himself, and walked over to the window sill where the parrot was perching. Well, Bert, you heard. Speak. Now, our parrot is a cool-headed customer. And just to show that he wasn't going to be pushed around that easily, he casually scratched the back of his head with his claw. After a longish silence, he said, Say the magic word and I might help you. The sailor looked around the room hoping for some advice. When none was forthcoming, he sighed and said, All right. Pretty please? That's better, replied the parrot. For your information, I taught myself English, and I'm currently studying Egyptian hieroglyphics. But that's by the by. I'm a former major in the Space Force, and while on a top-secret mission to the outreaches of the galaxy, I made contact with the Commander-in-Chief of the Birds who are currently attacking this planet. Gentlemen, we are dealing with an alien intelligence that is far more formidable than any previously encountered. I'm pretty sure that I know how we can counter this attack before it's too late for the world. I must speak to the Prime Minister urgently. Now, if the Rear Admiral had heard this speech from a human being, he would probably have considered him to be certifiably stark raving mad. But he was so struck by this parrot's ability to speak fluent English that he saw this was a matter that could only be decided at the highest levels. He immediately made his car available to whisk the parrot to London. Four hours later, the parrot addressed an emergency meeting of the War Cabinet at Number 10 Downing Street. The Prime Minister introduced him to the assembled ministers, generals and scientists with the words... What you're about to hear will completely change your understanding of the universe and everything forever. The parrot hopped onto the PM's shoulder and made a sound like this. Quack! The faces around the room looked at the Prime Minister with somewhat puzzled expressions. What were they to make of a man who brought a pet to work at a time like this? And then, after a painful silence, the parrot said... Just kidding. In actual fact, I can talk just like you. And that got their attention. They were, as the saying goes, gobsmacked. And if you think I'm smart, continued the parrot, think again. The birds who are currently attacking our world are a hundred times smarter than I am. They have shut down your telecommunication systems. That was but a trivial matter for them. They achieved it by the power of thought alone. Yes, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. We are experiencing a brainwave attack by some of the most powerful minds in the universe. But fear not, for I have the solution. We must deploy a thought field to protect the world against the mind attack. Again, I tell you. If they had heard these words from one of their own, they would have called in the men in white coats to cart him off to the loony bin. But when you meet a parrot who has the power to talk, it's pretty impressive. It changes everything. Still, there were those around the table who thought that it was madness to do as the bird said. Some said that he was a circus trick. Others that he was an enemy agent. They would have checked him out on the internet. Only it wasn't working. In the end, they had no choice but to believe him, because the food of the world was being gobbled up so fast that soon there would be nothing left to eat. It took 48 hours to fully mobilise the army. Convoys of trucks headed west to Wales and north to Scotland. The soldiers slung kit bags over their shoulders and began to trek up the tracks to the tops of the mountains. On the way up, 
They were harassed by hawks and falcons, but they fought off the airborne attackers. All in all, 15,000 men camped at or near the gusty peaks of the Cairngorms and the Grampian mountain range. Some of the platoon sergeants hung wind chimes on tent poles and they swung to and fro, ringing out at random. Then the order came for the troops to lay down their weapons and sit cross-legged on the ground. This and the following manoeuvre was all according to the precise instructions laid down by the parrot. It was an entirely new form of warfare. Defence through tantric meditation. The men and women of the British Armed Forces closed their eyes and began to breathe in the mountain air, slowly and deeply. As they did so, they counted each breath backwards. One hundred, ninety-nine, ninety-eight, ninety-seven, and so forth. When eventually they reached zero, they began to chant, Om. The unit commanders timed the chant. At the end of half an hour, they banged gongs and tinkled little triangles. The soldiers changed their chant. Meow. I think by now you may have gathered an appreciation of the true genius of the parrot. He had devised the perfect counter-attack to fend off the feathered offensive. If there's one sound that's bound to break a bird's brainwave, it's meow. The deep collective meditation of the armed forces reached out far and wide, even into outer space, for there is nothing so powerful as thought. And if the truth be known, the power of the human soul is one of the strongest forces in the universe. And when it is correctly channeled, it can easily overcome an alien invasion. It's just that on a normal day, people waste so much of their thinking capacity on trivial pursuits like Facebook or computer games or Saturday morning cartoons. When human thought is correctly channeled and concentrated, there is no force that can match it. And so, the mass forces of the alien birds were utterly routed and flew off in terror. The incoming brain waves generated by the owl and his deep thinking birds bounced back off the human mind shield. The world was saved. And it was all thanks to my friend, the parrot. Thank you, Astro Pup. And of course, you can hear all his earlier adventures on the site at storynori.com. For now, from me, Richard Scott, goodbye.